we are all ready, we can we can start with the presentations. So, well, besides a very very good colleague and friend of many researchers in the lab, uh, uh, Lourdes uh, has been working in in UK for a long time already, and she holds a position of professor of, of 3 division, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. uh, at the Department of Computer Science in, in UCL, University College London. And well, her, her research, at least uh, lately, uh, has been focused on, on the inference of 3D information from single images and videos. So today she's going to talk as uh, you have seen from the title about how to learn 3D representations uh, of the world from both images and video. And um, well, you have had the chance to read the abstract, so I think I'm not going to extend myself too much more. Just uh, thank, uh, thanks Lourdes again for accepting our invitation. Uh, we are all very, very glad to see you here. Uh, of course, in thank person. You. As, as usual, we, we say all the time in person would be better, but it's very, it's very nice to at least have you have the chance to have you online. Uh, so I think we can we can start and then the floor is yours. Julio, if the recording is is ready, I think yeah, we're already we are going. OK, we are streaming. Perfect. So Lourdes, uh, thanks again. And whenever you want. Yeah. That's great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Anna and, and everyone else in the in this master's program for inviting me to talk today. Um, as, as Anna just said, um, you know, I, I have many friends in, in Zaragoza. I still I still remember the very first time that I went to give a seminar and uh, may, maybe some of you, uh, maybe some of you remember <laughs> this was many, many years ago. Um, so we've had, you know, we've we've had a lot, uh, a lot in common in in terms of the the topics that that we that we're looking at in my research group and uh, and the kind of things that you you're doing in in Zaragoza. Um, so yeah, thank you for inviting me today to talk to you about um, well, what I what I think has always been and still the most exciting problem in computer vision right now. Uh, which is how do we build representations of the world that are 3D aware and how do we do that from images only or from videos that have been taken from a single camera. So this monocular reconstruction is really at the heart of everything that, that we do in my team. Um, so I've been working on this area in this area of uh, 3D learning um, for about 25 years now. Um, so I, I hope I can offer you a, a perspective and how we, of how important, um, you know, both building geometric models and using machine learning is for has been for th for this field. Um, so you know, I'm 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 actually going to start talking a little bit about maybe you know some old school methods. Um, some of you might uh, might think, oh, you know, why is she talking about these these older methods? But I, I really think that, especially for 3D vision, it, it's very important to, to really realize that, you know, that there are many things that we don't really have to learn. We already have very good mathematical models to, to represent maybe variations of, of shape um, and, and other, other geometric properties of, of how images are formed. And it's, it's really, really good to actually you know, understand these these models well before we go into how can machine learning now help us to to enhance that. Um, so I'm just going to start by by showing you this image. Um, so th this is this is a really busy image, right? So we see um, this very busy market, um, and it turns out that as humans, we we actually get an instant sense of of 3D understanding. Um, so this is a two dimensional image, but our perception is, is instantly 3D. Um, some of this 3D percep uh, perception is, is purely geometric, perhaps due to perspective. Um, perspective is helping us to understand the layout of this busy market. Okay. We can instantly um, tell turns what's closer, what's far away. And somehow, you know, a, a 3D layout for this scene. 
Um, but a lot of our 3D understanding is via our prior knowledge. Uh, we know the rough shape, color, texture of the different fruits that we see in this market. We can tell how far away a, a person would have to reach to actually pick up one of these uh, one of these fruits in their hands. And we we also know, for instance, how how heavy, for instance, one of these pumpkins would actually feel in our hands. So we have so much prior knowledge um, that in some ways, you know, this 3D understanding task, it, it seems like an absolutely perfect task uh, for a machine learning um, algorithm to solve. Um, however, when we look at the computer vision data sets that have been collected um, over the years, um, it turns out that, that the community has really focused on on, on harvesting 2D annotations. So, um, you know, to, to be able to, to learn 3D from images, we, we, in principle, we would need to have these, these 3D annotations instead. But, you know, um, when we look at these, um, at these data sets, we have class, uh, we have annotations such as class labels, masks, key points. Um, these are really easy uh, and cheap to annotate. Um, but you know, aligning these, uh, aligning ground truth 3D shapes with these images, as as you can see here on the right, that that's something that's that's a lot harder uh, to. It's a lot. It's a lot harder to collect. So although some important efforts have happened in recent years to collect 3D data sets such as ScanNet uh, or Matterport, for instance, they're still quite limited, and in particular, they're very limited to indoor scenes. Um, so in that sense, you know, if we, if we think about, um, you know, how we would solve this in, in, a, in an easy way, how uh, using, using machine learning or, or deep learning, if we wanted to go down the easy route of using a fully supervised reconstruction approach, um, you know, in, in some ways it's completely out of the question because we just don't have enough uh, alignment of, of images and, and 3D shapes with their correct orientations as well um, to learn in, in this very, uh, in this fully supervised way. However, it, it turns out that we have actually solved this problem before. So we have actually solved the problem of 3D reconstruction from weak annotations, such as just 2D observations or even directly from, from the images themselves without any 3D labels. So we, we've actually solved this problem in the computer vision community. So if we look back at old school geometric methods for 3D reconstruction, these are really in essence weakly supervised or self-supervised methods, right? So for instance, one of the big successes in the era of geometric computer vision, you know, back in the, the 90s or the early 2000s, uh, was Structure from Motion, where we take um, a collection of images uh, as input, we extract some 2D features and we establish correspondences uh, of those features along a sequence or along, uh, you know, across these different images. And then what we do is that we normally, we estimate the parameters of our 3D representation, which in this case are the 3D coordinates of the points, uh, so a 3D map, and also the camera poses, such that when we then project back that 3D representation onto the images, we get back our observations. So in this case, we would get back our 2D, our 2D correspondences, the 2D points. So now, this is this is an analysis by by synthesis approach, uh, where what we're trying to do is build this 3D representation such that you know when we project uh, the representation back onto the image, we get back our our, our observations. Um, and what we're minimizing here is is an image reprojection loss. So I'm sure that this has been part of your course that you've been you know learning about how to. Um, you know how how to uh, do 3D reconstruction by minimizing a geometric reprojection loss, um, and you know this is we we don't have any ground truth uh, 3D, so um, we learn this 3D representation without any 3D annotations. Our loss is is completely 
uh, completely 2D. It's a, it's a two-dimensional loss. So another example is, is multi-view stereo. So here, our observations are the images themselves, so the intensities of the images in particular. And the problem we're solving is, can we reconstruct a dense 3D mesh such that when we re-render our estimate back onto the images, our synthesized observations are, agree completely with our input images. So to do this, essentially, we use a photometric loss to guide the estimation of the depth at each point. And the intensity of corresponding points um, should be the same. That, that's, the, that's the constraint that, that we're using, or that's the loss that we're minimizing. So we're trying to infer the depth such that, you know, when we render the images back, corresponding points have, have the same intensity. So again, no 3D annotations here either. These two examples that, that I've just shown you, the inference of the parameters of the 3D representation is done via optimization, um, which is, you know, at, in, in some ways, if we now think about, you know, how we would solve this, uh, if we were thinking of a learning approach, again, what, what we're doing is we're, we're minimizing a loss. We're also running some sort of optimization. So, the intuition here is that we could potentially use neural networks for the inference, uh, or we could even use neural networks um, to represent the scene as well. Um, so, you know, this is something that we're going to see later, and I imagine that you all kind of understand or know what, what's coming. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's important to, you know, to look at these problems from a from a high level and really understand that this analysis by synthesis approach, you know, we we, we can we can use different methods for inference. We can use optimization. We can use um, we can use deep learning and we can also use different methods for representation, which is, you know, we could use explicit representations or we could even use. Uh, networks to to encapsulate the three D representation. So now uh, a world of options uh, opens opens up. Um, so which representations do we use, for instance? Um, so you know we could use, for instance, a discrete voxel representation, uh, which can be processed nicely via three D convolutions, for instance. Or we could use uh, an unstructured point cloud, for instance, or we could use meshes that have also some idea about neighborhood. Or we could use uh, an implicit continuous representation, such as a sign distance function. Or perhaps even more exciting, you know, we could actually represent the scene um, using a fully connected neural network that stores values uh, for each 3D point location, it's actually storing values such as, for instance, its occupancy, the occupancy probability for each 3D point location. So, you know, this is this is actually really nice. You know, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of what representation we can use. Um, we also have, uh, we also can, you know, choose the the image formation models that that we uh, that we use here. So. Um, you know, we all know that um, that the way that images are formed are through, you know, the interaction. So we have a few different things we have that are, are, are interacting. On the one hand, we've got the actual geometry of the scene and the materials um, that the scene is formed uh, is formed of. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have the lighting and how does that interact with the geometry and the materials? Um, and of course, the viewpoint to then generate an image. So, you know, how far do we actually go into modeling all of these different things? Do we just model uh, geometry and viewpoint and not model lighting or and not model material? Or do we actually have richer models that also can cope with variations in lighting or that can sort of learn what sort of materials um, we, we're actually using? Um, at the same time, you know, we can also, you know, what are the observations that we're using? So we can abstract, for instance, the image and we can only use key points or masks. Um, and, uh, you know, 
like we, we were saying in, in structure from motion, we're kind of abstracting the information that it's there's in the image and we're just taking the key points as the uh, as the observations that we use for under for then learning or, 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 or inferring the geometry. Or do we actually use images directly or do we use depth maps, for instance? Um, so, you know, if we're using RGBD images, for instance. And then, of course, another important thing is what annotations do we actually use? And I've already discussed this a little bit. Um, you know, do we use do, do we have the luxury of having some some 3D annotations? Do we have a, a data set that provides us with, with some uh, strong supervision in the form of 3D annotations? Or, you know, maybe more interestingly, um, can we actually train our models using only weak supervision or even a supervised so 2D, uh, 2D annotations or even design a self-supervised approach that doesn't need any, any annotations at all. Um, so, you know, all of these are, are, are interesting questions um, that, that we, we um, you know, we, we need to think about when we're, when we're designing our 3D inference systems. Um, but yeah, so far we've just talked about capturing a static world, right? So where, you know, all of the views that, that we have are representing exactly the, the same geometry. There's, the geometry is not changing over time. Um, but in many cases, what we actually want to capture is the dynamics, right? So here you can see some, some 3D scans. These are actually my, my children a few years ago when they were little. Um, and um, you know we we kind of captured we went round and captured them with a with a Kinect cam camera and uh, you know yes they, they 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 capture the 3D geometry but at one particular instant in time you know it's for 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 us it's probably a lot more interesting to think about this kind of problem you know can we actually reconstruct any possible def deformation and configuration of deformable of deformable objects. And, uh, and this is the main topic of my research. So learning these 3D deformable models that can explain how the shapes of objects evolve over time, how they vary or how they vary across a, a category. Uh, and in particular, you know, just want to repeat this again, that what my research is about is really doing this from, from images directly. Um, so this actually brings in one more element to our 3D representation which is um you know do we actually use shape priors do we do we uh do we need to use or should we be using shape deformation priors that encapsulate the variations of shapes and deformations across a category of objects so you know this is this is a, a big part of what my talk is going to be about today um so how do we actually use these models um, do we, you know, typically something we can do is that we can pre-train them. So we can train them uh, first uh, using a lot of, you know, perhaps a lot of 3D data. Um, and, um, you know, this is what, what these very successful 3D models uh, for modeling faces or for modeling bodies, such as 3D morphable models or the simple model for, for, for bodies have done. So you capture thousands or and thousands and thousands of 3D scans. Uh, all of them are aligned, and then you know you 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 learn uh, you learn a model. For instance, in 3D in in 3D MM models, it's 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 actually a, a PCA model that's going to encapsulate um, the variations of of shape and the variations of of texture uh, as well. Um, and um, and also facial expressions, for instance, and something similar with this parametric model for bodies, the simple model. Um, so you know, here on the top, we have a, a, a more interesting and and recent approach to actually learn these uh, these priors, these shape priors, which is by using a neural representation. Um, so this maybe a lot of you have already seen this. Uh, so this is actually deep SDF, uh, where now what we're training is actually uh, a model that's encapsulated in the weights of a neural network. And that neural network uh, is, is actually learning, uh, so the weights, uh, it's learning the, the weights and also a, uh, a latent space 
is is actually learning how how the shape of of objects varies uh, across a particular category here you can see an interpolation between two different latents uh, of you know two different very very different kinds of chairs and you know the network's actually learning um, to represent that 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 latent space and to decode those latent vectors into shapes in a in a smooth and continuous way so the question that we really want to ask ourselves now is you know it's 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 very nice to learn uh, these uh, th these 3D prior models from 3D data, um, but you know again that that requires capturing a lot of 3D data, and it also requires aligning all of this 3D data. So the big question for me has always been, you know, can we actually learn these priors from images directly without the need for that 3D data capture? So can we go directly uh, from images? to learning a, a, a latent representation or a, a prior uh, for, for, um, for deformable objects. So I'm now going to show you one example of this. Um, so this is, this is old work. Um, this is work from CBPR 2013. Um, but I, I think it's, it's nice to really capture the essence of, of, of what we're discussing. Uh, which is, you know, can we actually learn these uh, shape priors directly from images without having to capture 3D data, uh, without having, you know, we without needing any, any 3D data? Can we do it directly from images? So here the goal is to reconstruct a dense per pixel model of every frame in the sequence. So we have, you know, here we have a, a, a sequence of a person that's deforming and also performing some rigid motions and some non-rigid motions. And the idea is, you know, can we actually reconstruct every single frame and can we do this uh, densely? Can we actually reconstruct the whole, um, the whole 3D model every, every, single, every single pixel? So what are our observations? So we're going to go back to you know the the, the representation I I, I um, showed you at the beginning. Our observations are we're going to track all of the points in in every frame. So we're going to encapsulate the our observations are going to be uh, they're going to be these two D tracks. So we're tracking every point in every view, and this is what you can see here in the video. So you can see the original video, and here what you can see is this per pixel, you know, 3D tracking, it's very, very accurate. And you can see here this grid visualization. So our observations are these 2D point trajectories um, over time, right? And then what we said is that what we want to do next is that we want to, what we want to do is reconstruct a model such that when we project the mesh back onto the image via the camera, we get our observations back. Or in other words, the 3D points reproject back onto the tracks. Um, so, you know, these are the tracks. They're encapsulated in this matrix W. The matrix W just contains the coordinates, the 2D coordinates of all the points in all the frames, so my tracks. Um, and this matrix S is going to represent the dense 3D shape for every frame. So we kind of stack them all together. And these R matrices represent the camera matrices for every single frame. But now the problem is that this is not enough. There would be an infinite number of possible shapes that could reproject onto, this, onto the same measurements. We, we need to actually add a prior. And the prior in this case is that if we took all the shapes from the entire sequence, um, we actually know that they lie in a low dimensional embedding. And we can impose this by minimizing the trace norm. So if we took a big matrix, matrix that contains the shape in every single frame, we can compress that matrix and say, you know, what is the, the lowest possible rank matrix that can, that can still represent this, this variation of shapes? So what we're doing is explaining all of the frames in the sequence with as few components as possible. So K here is, is a lot smaller than the number of frames. And this is the optimization that we're doing. We are minimizing uh, this trace norm. 
So basically what we're doing, essentially what we're saying is that the shape at each frame, sorry, the shape at each frame can be explained as a linear combination of some basis shapes. But these basis shapes are actually unknown. This is the important thing. So we're learning the basis of shapes that uh, would allow us to, to represent our scene, to reconstruct our scene in 3D. And of course, these are 3D bases. Um, so this is what we call a low rank prior. So our prior is quite loose in a way. Um, we are saying, you know, we can reconstruct the scene uh, with, you know, very, very, very few components and every frame will be a linear combination of those few components. But we're trying to learn and estimate this, these, these components. So we take all of these terms, you know, the reprojection error that we talked about first, um, the low rank prior that we've just described, and we also add a smoothness prior. So we actually want, because we're trying to reconstruct a, a, a dense surface, we also want uh, the surface to, to be smoothed. And, and here is the optimization, right? Um, so this is uh, the optimization that we need to solve. We take all the frames in the sequence and we are actually learning uh, a representation in the, in the form of a low rank embedding that can explain uh, the shapes. And, and later, later on, we could potentially take a new sequence and then you know, we could then project that sequence onto this subspace and just learn the coefficients or estimate the coefficients uh, for that for that new sequence. Um, so, you know, here are some results of uh, the face reconstruction. Now, this was the very first dense non-rigid reconstruction method for monocular video sequences back in 2013. Um, you know, and as I said, maybe I'll insist a little bit more. So there, there's just no 3D uh, no, no 3D labels here. Um, now we have some results uh, on on a on a different kind of sequence and the sequence of a heart. Um, and we here we're really taking advantage of the fact that we can reconstruct any shape because we are actually learning this low rank representation directly from the 2D data. We're not using a pre learned model. We are learning the model uh, through through this sequence throughout this sequence. Okay, so you know this is this is nice, but but um, this this approach actually had a few a few problems, and one of them was that you had to have the whole sequence in advance, right? Um, we needed to have all of the frames in order to be able to learn this representation. Um, so instead, um, the, the other the other issue is that we had decoupled the the, the the feature tracking so we were doing you know we were estimating the tracks for the features we were decoupling that from the reconstruction so we were first doing tracking and then reconstructing so in this in this further work um, we also follow an analysis by synthesis approach um, but now what we're trying to do is that we're trying to look we're trying to estimate this 3d deformation field so it's a it's a dense 3d deformation field we're computing like a 3d vector that tells us where each of the vertices in the template mesh went in the next frame um, so we start off with with a template that gives us the kind of initial configuration um, and now we're trying to to track this non-rigid object over time so we're learning this 3D deformation field by, um, by saying, okay, now if we apply those deformations to our current estimate and we render it back, you know, how far away are my images? So the images, the live current frame and the render uh, should be as similar as possible, right? So again, this is an analysis by synthesis approach where now, what we're measuring is the discrepancy between our image and our rendered estimates. So again, we have a photometric gloss, just like the multiple uh, multi-view stereo uh, problem that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, we are measuring the discrepancy in, in terms of RGB color between the, uh, the, the, the image that we have, the current image and, and the rendered image. 
of course just with this again you know we don't have we don't we wouldn't have enough information we could have ambiguity so we also use some local defamation priors um, and we use something that's used a lot in in non-rigid tracking which is to assume that locally surfaces uh, behave rigidly um, so this prior is called as rigid as possible and we also have a total variation uh, term that's actually preserving spatial smoothness. So neighboring points will, will deform similarly. Um, and of course, you know, we then gather all of these terms into a big um, energy optimization, and uh, we estimate all of the all of the parameters, which are you know these deformation um, th these deformation fields or this warp three D warp field for every frame of the sequence. But we do this in a non-line approach. And what's really cool about this method is that, you know, we can uh, we can parallelize it and we can accelerate it and uh, it runs pretty much in, in real time. So here you can see the uh, input images and here you can see the 3D reconstructions and it's obviously an on online method. And it's you know it's nice and dense. We have a reconstruction for every every point, um, etc. Okay, so now it's so this is all very very nice when we when we're looking at objects for which we don't have any any three D data to to learn a model um, or to pre train this prior. But in some cases, you know, such as the face, we do actually have this data and we, we do have really powerful pre-trained 3D models that explain the variations of the shape, uh, the facial expressions and, and the texture um, as well. Um, and, and can even, even model illumination, for instance. Um, so, you know, this is, this is something that it, in, so, in some ways, you know, it's, it's, a, similar, it's a similar approach to what you saw before, what we're doing is at inference time, uh, we're optimizing using a photometric gloss uh, to estimate the model parameters. And the model parameters will be uh, the pose of the head, uh, the actual shape of that, uh, uh, the, the, the shape or the identity of, of the individual, um, the albedo, so the texture of the face, the illumination parameters and the facial expression. So these are all of the parameters that we would need to estimate in the case of uh, in the case of, of uh, reconstructing faces, and you know the idea is exactly the same. You know, estimate the model parameters such that when we resynthesize the images, we get back the same observations. Um, and I just want to show you, you know, a, a, an example of an application of this um, to video synthesis. Um, so uh, a few years ago, four years ago now, we started up a, a company here in London uh, with, uh, with some other colleagues and entrepreneurs. And uh, so our company is called Synthesia uh, and we're working on, on, on video synthesis. Um, so I'm first going to show you, um, I hope the audio works well. Um, so I'm first going to show you an example of how we do uh, video to video um, synthesis, right? So the idea here is that we have two actors. We have a, let's call it an input or, or source uh, actor and then an output or, or target actor. We're reconstructing both sequences, both faces in 3D. And then we are mapping the motion of the source actor to the target actor and then resynthesizing. Um, so here you're going to see now um, a project that we did. So you can hear the video, the, the audio. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Hivyo tunazindua kampeni ya sauti. 
malaria. Speak up and say, malaria must. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this video was was actually produced by by us by by Synthesia, and uh, using the technique that I that I explained before. So let, let me just um, okay. I wanted to go back here. Yes. Um, so you know we're tracking the phase, we're producing a three D model, um, and you know this is actually our our, our re rendered three uh, D model. And this is the, the error that we're making uh, in terms of synthesis, right? So we're comparing the input image with the resynthesized image. Um, so, you know, when we resynthesize these images, the observations are the observation, we're getting back the observations. So the errors are, are very, very small. So this modeling is actually working incredibly well. And this is what then allows us to also use, um, you know, generative adversarial networks so GANs to then also you know fill in the areas that, that we don't actually model um, so I'm not going to go into the details about how this works um, but just kind of maybe you know let you know about how how powerful this is in terms of you know now we can we can go one step beyond which is to now uh, go directly from text uh, to generating the video. Um, so the first thing that we always do is to generate, a, to learn, you know, a 3D model for, for the person that we're trying to, that we're trying to synthesize, that we're trying to animate. Um, and then obviously we're learning a mapping between, um, between, in this case, you know, we turn the text into audio and then we're learning a mapping between audio and the, the 3D parameters of the model that we then resynthesize. Um, so, you know, you can all go to our website, uh, the company's called Synthesia, and uh, you can all try it for free. Uh, so I've just, uh, you know, made this little video. So this is what I typed and you can see here. I'm excited to be here to demonstrate how Synthesia allows you to make videos simply by typing text. The reason it works so well is that my face is modeled in 3D. Okay, so I, I just wanted you, you know, to get a flavor of, of the, the potential applications of, of this uh, of this face modeling. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be going here to have to move on quite, quite quickly because I, I don't have a lot of time left. Um, so another area that we've been working on a lot is on reconstructing human pose estimation, uh, human poses from, from a single image. And here really, what we wanted to solve is, is two problems simultaneously. So to go from a single RGB image to being able to detect and uh, find that the 2D pose of the person and also the 3D pose. So we're jointly uh, estimating 2D and 3D pose from a single RGB image. And in theory, you know, what we wanted to do is, is not really not not to need any any images that were annotated with 3d so I, i'm going to to show you how we do this so the idea is that we have two completely independent sources of training data so on the one hand on the left you can see that we've got images for which we only have 2d joint annotations so our annotations are just 2d uh, only 2d um, and then at the same time we have an independent 3d mocap uh, 3D mocap uh, data um, data set. So we have, you know, uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of 3D mocap uh, uh, data for, you know, for different actors, for, for different people. And these two are decoupled, they're independent. So we don't necessarily have, you know, the same poses that we have displayed in, in, in our 2D joint annotations in the 3D mocap data. And, and we definitely, what we don't have is pairings of, we don't have an image for which we actually have the 3D annotations. So these are two independent sources of training data. And the idea here is, you know, to do human pose estimation from a single image. The first thing that we do is that we take the 3D mocap data and we learn a 3D model. So, you know, same as before, we pre-trained this model. So this is a, a, a 3D model. You can think about it. It's a, a, a probabilistic uh, PPCA model. 
Um, and we've actually, it's a mixture of PPCA models, in fact, um, because we have you know, different, uh, it's, it's like, think about it like a mixture of Gaussians, but with, but with PCA models. Um, and this is so that we can capture different modes in the distribution. So you can see over here, you know, we have some, uh, some poses that are kind of lying down poses, other poses that are more standing up poses. Uh, and, you know, we built this model that can explain these variations in the, in the poses. So this is a parametric 3D model. And then what we do is that we also have uh, an optimization uh, that's differentiable where we can, given 2D poses, we can actually estimate the parameters of that specific, uh, the, the pose that's displayed in that specific image. So we have a 3D model, uh, and then we also have a, a differentiable method to go from 2D observations to 3D observations. And then, you know, how do we now take advantage of, of using deep learning, you know, to, to actually uh, boost these, this, this approach? So, you know, imagine that we were just, so our, our goal was just to, um, to detect the 2D joints, right? So what we would do is that we would have images as input, and we have we have 2D annotations. So we have you know some convolutional layers and some other fully connected layers. And what we're doing is that we are predicting these belief maps. In each belief map, this is our current you know what, what's the probability that uh, one of the joints is placed in in each of the pixels, right? So these are belief maps that we have for every single joint. And you know we can then you have we we have a 2D loss given that we, we do have 2D annotations. Um, so that would be like a standard way of doing, you know, 2D estimation of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the 2D joints. But what we do is to then, on top of that, what we do is because we have this um, 3D lifting uh, method that's differentiable using the pre-learned model that I showed you before, we can lift these poses into 3D we can then project them back onto 2D. And what we can see is, you know, um, do we, we confuse these, these observations and now we can actually apply the loss here. So, you know, we're not just applying the loss to these predicted belief maps, but we're also applying the loss to these pose belief maps, you know, po belief maps that have actually gone into 3D and, and we have projected them back into 2D again. And as a side product, we also get this 3D reconstruction, right? Um, so we're jointly learning to estimate 2D and 3D. Um, so we can go one step further, which is to, you know, to not even need that 2D loss. Uh, we, can, we can just impose that these predictive belief maps should be the same, the ones that are just predicted by the image and the ones that are lifted into 3D and projected back. And this would be a self-supervised approach. Um, and, you know, you can see this uh, human 3D pose estimation in the wild. Uh, these were images for which we didn't have any 3D annotations. We didn't have any 2D annotations either. Um, these were part of a, a project we had with Ocado Technology, where we had technicians in a warehouse working on maintenance tasks, and we had to track them. Um, so, you know, we needed to be able to, to use many, many images for which we didn't have 2D or, or 3D annotations. So, you know, this is exciting in the sense that, you know, we can combine our 3D models with a lot of, you know, training from seeing a lot of data, right? Okay, I think I'm, I'm going to skip this part, but, you know, what I wanted to show you here is that we can also work on uh, on on 3d on on dense 3d shapes as well um, and the next thing that I'm going to talk about is is more related to to slam and and whole scene reconstruction um, you know maybe some of you are, are aware of of some work from my group that we did uh, back in 2018 this work is called mask fusion uh, where we were doing uh, we were actually, uh, in this case, we have an RGBD camera. Uh, so it's a camera where we have both the RGB stream and a depth stream. And what we wanted to do was to, um, was to combine together 
the power of um, recognition, and in this case, we were using mask CNN. So we were running mask CNN on the RGB frames so that we could have masks for all the objects that we were interested in and semantic labels as well. Um, and our goal really was to create a 3D reconstruction where we could you know, transfer these, uh, uh, these labels onto the 3D map. Um, but more than that, you know, we were also, as you can see here, we were allowing objects in the scene to move. So we were actually able to track these objects in, in real time as they moved um, independently. Um, and of course, you know, we were, uh, we were combining you know, reconstruction with recognition and with, with segmentation. And, you know, in that, in that sense, we were able to, to track uh, dynamic scenes like, like the one you can see here. Okay, so I mean, we were we were very very excited uh, with this with this method um, because it you know it really allowed us to to provide uh, a reconstruction that's not just a bunch of three D coordinates, but a reconstruction that has semantic meaning. And you know, we're instantiating all the different objects that we're interested in. So you know, for robotics applications, this was actually a really interesting step forward. However, um, you know what if uh, what what you could see in that in that video is that the reconstruction of the objects was incomplete, right? So what we what we weren't actually using any prior semantic or shape information um, to reconstruct the objects. So the objects were incomplete. We could only reconstruct um, the parts of the object that were visible. What if we wanted to move towards reconstructions more like this, right? So the example on the right, where we reconstruct each object as a complete shape, even when we have partial observations. So this is something that we tackled uh, in our paper um, in, in last year, in, in uh, CVPR last year, the paper's called Frodo. And here what we're doing is taking advantage of uh, deep SDF as a continuous shape representation, a deep continuous shape representation of shape. So we, we take, we use a pre-learned uh, 3D shape prior for each object category. And in this case, we take advantage of this way of re representing shapes in a very compact way. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, how do we, how, how, how do you train these, these shape priors? So you feed a, a 3D point location to the network. And what the network is learning is to return a value that's related to the geometry uh, of the shape. So in the case of occupancy networks, this is work from Andreas Geiger's uh, lab that was uh, simultaneous to, to deep SDF. Um, they were actually providing the occupancy probability of each of the points. Uh, whereas in deep SDF, they were, the network was actually learning to predict the SDF value of any, any point um, that, that's on or off the surface. So these representations can be trained from 3D data. And the really nice thing is that they're incredibly compact. So, you know, they're really, uh, we have a very, very compact representation in the form of the, the weights of the, of the neural network. So if we look more closely at deep SDF, the architecture is an auto decoder. And at training time, um, the weights of the decoder are learnt but also an embedding of latent codes where each training shape will be assigned a different code in this embedding. And then at test time, um, we take an incomplete point cloud as input, um, and then you know, the weights of the decoder are fixed, and then an optimization is carried out to estimate the code that when we decode it through the prior, it leads to the shape that most agrees with the current observations. Okay, so this is this is actually what we what we did in uh, in in our in our paper Frodo. We we pre-trained the the shape priors, the the deep SDF priors for chairs, and you know we would have another one for tables, for instance. And then the idea is, can we actually 
estimate the code associated with each of the e each of the instance uh, of chairs, for instance, uh, just from from images? Can we go from image detections to this dense representation of, of objects uh, just by running an optimization approach that looks at photometric consistency? Um, and um, you know, this is what we did. So the input were a, a bunch of, of images and uh, we were using this decoder uh, or uh, yeah, the, the, this deep SDF uh, decoder. And now what you can see is that it works in, in steps, right? So first objects are, are detected. So those detections are then lifted to 3D bounding boxes. So we get an initial estimate for the pose. We also get an initial estimate for the shape code. And now the shape codes are refined in two stages based on photometric uh, cost terms. And you can see that we finally get, you know, a really nice uh, 3D reconstruction um, for, the, for the objects. So here are some results on, on, on a scanlet sequence, for instance. Okay, so this is this is really what what's driving the optimization. So we have an energy that's looking at photo consistency terms, also some geometric uh, reprojection terms and some silhouette terms. And you know this is an optimization where we are estimating the shape code and the orientation uh, of each of each object um, and using the the uh, the the deep SDF. Uh, shape prior as the you know the, the prior that, that's driving that's driving the optimization and here we have some some results comparing with with other methods at the time so our reconstructions are here uh, on the on the right so you can see that you know we're getting very very kind of nice accurate reconstructions and you know on hard scenes such as scenes that come from Scanly. okay so we've now put all this together. This is some new work that's going to appear in 3DV very soon in a couple of months. Um, we've also, we've, we've put this together within a, a sparse uh, SLAM backbone. So we're actually using Orb SLAM, um, you know, uh, derived uh, exactly in, in Zaragoza, but by you guys. We're using Orb SLAM as our SLAM backbone. And now we're actually doing this the same thing in, in real time, right? So we've uh, proposed a, a new SLAM method called DSP. So it's an object-oriented SLAM uh, method with deep shape priors. And you can see that, you know, what we get are fully dense uh, reconstructions of, of cars, even from very, very, you know, very sparse observations. Um, so here, I just want to show you so we, we can work with, um, with stereo sequences, sequences that have um, sequences that have, for instance, LIDAR information as well. Perhaps what's even more exciting is that we can also work with monocular. So this is from Kitty. You can see that we get a map that's very, very nice because we don't have just points, we also have objects. But this is what I wanted to show you. We can also, uh, work with monocular RGB sequences. Um, and here you can see that we're simultaneously estimating the shape of the this dense shape of the car using the uh, deep SDF prior um, while we're we're actually tracking tracking the camera pose and reconstructing also the rest of the scene with with sparse points that come from from Orbslam. Um, so this is actually you know some some really really nice work we can we can also apply it to other objects here you can see some more details we can apply it to chairs as well so here you can see like a, a nice reconstruction of of a chair okay um so just to finish off uh i uh, i'm going to show you perhaps i i don't have a really much time so i'm just going to show you you know i'm i'm going to assume that everybody is quite familiar now with with neural radiance fields so representing scenes as neural radiance fields for view synthesis this was an incredibly popular paper in eccv um, so where 
you know, it's it's sort of related to deep SDF in the sense that we're also using, uh, it, it also uses a, a neural network. But in this case, what the neural network is trying to predict is the RGB color and the, the density of each point by using just the 2D rendering loss. So using a photometric loss. So now there's no 3D ground truth. Um, the, the, the scene is actually learned just from resynthesizing images um, and training this network to predict the correct uh, RGB color and the correct density for each 3D point such that when those are rendered back using volumetric rendering, um, the loss, the photometric loss is satisfied, right? Um, so, you know, you can think about this as we have posed images as observations. We represent the scene using a neural network where every 3D point will be, uh, the, the network will learn to infer its RGB color and its density such that when we render those points back, we get back the original images. Uh, so, you know, the same analysis by synthesis method that we saw before. And in some recent work, we've looked at how to generalize these neural radiance fields to the case where we don't just have a single scene, but we actually have um, a category of objects. So, you know, how do we actually represent the variation of shapes and textures across categories such as cars or, or chairs? And how do we do that from images only? So, you know, what's exciting about this is that in some ways we're using the same analysis by synthesis approach that I showed you before. Um, but we are, uh, we are actually, now our image observations are observations of different shapes from different viewpoints. At training time, we know the camera pose, so the, the poses are known. And we're learning two latent spaces. So this latent space to represent shape and another latent space to represent variations of code. So now we have a conditional uh, uh, neural network, right? Um, and what's exciting is that at, uh, at test time, we have an input image and now we're optimizing the shape code, the texture code, and we can also optimize the camera pose. So we can do single view reconstruction um, and we can, for, you know, from a single image of an unknown object that we haven't seen before from an unknown pose, we can estimate the shape code, the texture code and the camera pose. And uh, here you've, you've just seen um, the, how the optimization, let me just play this video again. So this is, these are the iterations of the test time optimization. And once we've optimized, we can then render the, the car from multiple viewpoints. The exciting thing is that we can, so we can, we can do novel view synthesis uh, after optimizing the shape codes and the texture codes. But what's exciting is that we can also edit shapes and we can also edit textures. So here you have a situation where we are editing the texture. So we have a reference shape and then we have other images giving us new textures and we edit those. Or here, you know, you can see this is, these are the target shapes and we're modifying just the, the shape code um, to synthesize new, new shapes with keeping the, the texture constant. Um, so now, you know, we have this control at synthesis time over shape codes and texture codes and they're completely, completely decoupled. Um, we can also perform single view reconstruction, as I was saying before, and we can do this for, um, you know, both synthetic images and also real images. Okay, so um, this is this is the end of the, of the lecture. So, um, you know, what what's next in in three D vision? So you've all seen, you know, this explosion of NERF. Uh, we were at ICCV last week. Maybe some of you were there. And, uh, you know, I can't remember how many papers, but uh, there, there were tons of papers that are trying to, you know, take advantage of this way in which we can represent the scene in a very, very compact way. And now trying to, you know, make it controllable. How can we control, you know, deformations? How can we control... Uh, variations of texture, how can we control the lighting or model the lighting? 
how can we actually learn these representations in in real time so you know it's really exciting times for for putting together geometry and and learning um but you know i think um if we go back at may, maybe some of the applications that some of you some in particular you know in your group you're so driven by by robotics applications um there's still a lot to do right um you know if you think about robots and and what what they can actually do with these 3d representations it's still very very limited and uh you know, I've just written here a few of the things that that we'll be we'll be looking at uh, over over the next few years, and uh, yeah, maybe we can we can discuss some of these in the in the questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, and sorry, I think I've taken a little bit more time than I should have. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry at all. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lourdes. I I'm gonna clap in behalf of everybody because <laughs> everybody's <laughs> muted. Uh, but you have gave us such a compact overview of 3D reconstruction for for all these years. And it's very nice to see how everything has evolved uh, so quickly, actually, in, in the last years. So thanks a lot. It has been really, really, really interesting talk. Uh, so now for the audience, uh, let's have a few minutes for questions. If, if Lourdes has time, I don't know how sharp you need to leave. No, uh, it's good. Okay, so then we can we can have a few minutes uh, for questions, and uh, then well we can proceed as you prefer. You can just uh, raise your hand, and I I, I, mean, I mean raise your hand in the in the Google Meet, or you can type in the chat. Uh, uh, so don't be shy and go ahead. Otherwise, we can maybe we can start launching some questions, but let's give a minute to to the students see if they. Um, I don't see any hands raised here. So yeah, actually, in in the meantime, uh, just to connect with the with a little bit with the with the last part, uh, since you were mentioning about all this craziness with, with the nerves and all this, right? Yeah. Um, so I was curious, so for now, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I haven't had time to go through all the late results on this, but just to see your opinion, it seems uh, also with 3D, it happened with the old, old school approaches, right? First, I uh, are more focused on specific objects, uh because modeling the whole scene is like a little bit like one step farther uh do you think with nerves so they start trying to also cover whole scenes right or or is it still a bit a bit too complex for for these models i don't know if you if you have seen yeah. or you have any. so because you, you know the, for the for original, the original nerf was was trying to capture full scenes um, but but it's limited to a specific scene, right? So um, you know th th this is this is typically what you have. You have a, a, a mm -hmm. bunch of images all from the same scene, and you're optimizing your neural representation with the idea that then you can provide any 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 new viewpoint that you didn't see that's not in your training set at test mm -hmm. time, and you could render you know fully photorealistic views. Um, but yes, you know, it's just that scene. So if you had a, a different scene, you would have to start all over again and you would have to re-optimize in a new model. Um, so, you know, I think I think that this this is now what what one of the areas in which NERF is being is being pushed is, you know, can we can we generalize? And now rather than having just a single scene, can we generalize? And you know, you you saw before in some of the examples. So these are papers from CBPR and mm -hmm. uh, and ICCV this year. You know, can can we actually uh, rep represent object categories or dynamic objects? You know, and, and there's some some really nice um, some some really nice work uh, for this. Uh, you know, I think I think that what what's difficult is that, for instance, all these methods that look at dynamic scenes. They're dynamic scenes, but in some ways they they're still a bit scene specific. 
So you can only represent really whatever sequence you had initially, right? And the control that you have there is time. Um, so it's not really that you can uh, that you can represent, you know, that that you you have a scene for or you have a, a sequence for one person and then another person and then another person, and you mm -hmm. learn from all of those. Mm -hmm. You actually learn a, a different representation for each of these. Uh, so I think that you know, going going beyond adding adding more control um, and um, yeah, just just being able to learn the deformation model, a, a, a more general deformation model. It's not just specific for that video. It, it's still it's still a hard thing to do. Um, yeah, to kind of modify the, the scene, right? Like really change the yeah. That. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's yeah. see. I'm sure we will see things uh, soon. <laughs> but... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> think, um, so yes. sorry, I think Nestor uh, had one question. Do you want to unmute yourself and you go ahead and ask Nestor? Yeah. Hello. So uh, I have a question about Frodo. Um, yeah. That you get both the the sparse and the dense uh, representations. Yes. But I I don't understand. Do, do you get the dense uh, representation from the sparse one, or are they independent? So we we initialize the the optimization. So if I if I just go back here, so we. Um, we, we first do the, the sparse optimization, uh, which is actually very fast. Um, and uh, and with that with that optimization, we already get an initial estimate for the for the for the six dot pose of the object and for the shape code. And then we do a final uh, refinement where we're then using the dense model. Okay. And using a, a photometric, a dense photometric term to drive that. Okay. okay and in fact, thanks. you know, often, often that that represent that that reconstruction is already quite good. <laughs> so, um, what we get from the sparse um, fr from the sparse representation or the sparse optimization is is already is already pretty good. Uh, but it's it's true that you know the photometric the final dense photometric optimization gives us you know maybe more details. So any any more questions from the audience from the students? Following a bit on this question, I, I oh sorry, let's uh, Alberto go ahead. Uh, I saw uh, an old video of Synthesia where you required uh, an actor to uh, to model the changes in, in, in the face and the voice. I assume that the, this new version uh, automates all of this using probably Gantz and, and all this. Am, am I yes. right? Or? Yes, that's right. So when we started the company, we were doing uh, video to video. Um, you know, we were mapping from one video to another video. Um, and we were we were focusing at that time more in uh, in dubbing, right? So we could have an actor, uh, the, the the source actor was was speaking in, in one language. So in the case of Beckham, you know, we had a lot of different actors that spoke all those different languages, and we we needed a video, and we were tracking the motion, reconstructing it in three D, and then mapping the three D motion to the three D model of Beckham, and then synthesizing that. Um, but now, yes, we have text um, to video, and um, yeah, that that's that's just uh, it's really great in the sense that it is it's 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 given us the opportunity to so you know now now the um, the company we we have a we have a platform uh, people can you know can can buy a subscription for for a month to generate a certain number of videos and minutes of video, so we we have. Um, yeah, now now it's a it's a SaaS um, platform, and uh, you know you you can go there and you can try it yourself for free, um, and then if you want to generate a few videos a month, you, know, you some of the subscriptions are as as cheap as maybe thirty dollars or something, um, and then you know some companies then then have their own avatars and they make their own avatars, uh, so. Yeah, it, this transition from being able to go from text to video has been really 
uh, what what's powered uh, the company as such. Yeah. And uh, specifically on modeling the <laughs> uh, the changes uh, in the face uh, and tracking mm -hmm. the movement, uh, all of this uh, is, is still using the the same techniques that you uh, presented earlier, or or is fully automated uh, using. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, in the past, I saw a few uh, repositories using uh, uh, GAN end to end, so a uh, few uh, short uh, face translation, things like that. I, I suppose that uh, those techniques don't uh, have that much uh, precision compared to, to the one you presented earlier, or, uh, mm. does, or is it improving over time? So, uh, I mean, the, the, the technology that we've developed at, at Synthesia is really a combination of, of using these 3D models to drive GANs, basically. Um, so we are, we are modeling I'm in- I'm more informed, yeah. We're modeling in 3D, so we're, we're, not doing, we're, not, we're not doing 2D GANs. We're actually, we have, you know, we kind of have a parametric representation of the 3D. So then that gives us a lot of control when we're doing the synthesis, right? And in the synthesis, the problem is that if you just synthesize what you've modeled, then obviously you know, the, the, the synthesis is not going to be perfect because we can't model everything. And that's where you know, some of the GANs, what, the, the GANs, what they're doing is that they're filling in, um, they're filling in the things that, that we can't really model. So for instance, the inside of the mouth, uh, a lot of the detail on the, on the on the on the faces and uh, and things like this but what we've what we've really learned and what we've really exploited is the fact that yeah we we know that you know 2d 2d modeling is just not enough um you know we we need to be modeling in in 3d and the gans that we're designing are actually 3d aware yeah i, I assume that uh, uh... You probably used GANs just for a specific task uh, because all of the demos I've seen so far lack a lot of uh, precision overall. So the, the results you presented earlier are quite ast astounding compared to, to previous uh, demos. So, so yeah, uh, mm. uh, I really love the, the final result. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's exciting. I think for me, it's been, you know, as a, uh, as an academic, as a, as a researcher, uh, as I said at the very beginning, you know, I uh, it is pretty much almost to the day, 25 years since I defended my my PhD thesis. <laughs> it was in October uh, 1996, so 25 years, and um, you know, it's not. It hasn't been until the last, really, the last three or four years that that 3D computer vision has really started to, you know, like fully fully work. Um, or, you know, maybe you could say five or six or seven years, I don't know. Um, we were, you know, we were, we were, we were working, it's, it's a very hard problem, you know, we're trying to solve these 3D representations from 2D only without having any 3D labels. It is a very hard problem to solve. Uh, but now, you know, because we now have the power of machine learning to actually help us, you know, what, what we can't model, we can't model everything, uh, and but now we have this 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 other uh, rich source of information, which is that that we can train we you know from data we can we can learn what we can't model, um, and I think that that combination is incredibly powerful. And just being able to see that you know we can now provide you know these products to our customers and uh, and 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 it works. You know, it's completely automated. The whole platform is completely automated. It's it's actually a, a joy to see that computer vision has actually got to that point. <laughs> yes, how everything comes together. Yeah. Anyway. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose Mari. Please uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lourdes, for your nice talk. You have made like a very broad summary. <laughs> from geometry to learning that uh, yes. <laughs> I really have enjoyed uh, a Thank lot. Thank you. <laughs> and I would like to make kind of general question mm -hmm. in this approach. Um, you have been one of the first researchers in dealing with the formation. It mm -hmm. seems that everything works as soon as it is rigid. And then it seems that real things are not rigid. But dealing with everything deforming is very hard. 
and then it seems that the real system has like a compromise about how big or how we limit the potential deformation. Um, can you make a discussion about what are the reasonable simplifying assumptions about uh, or that limit the deformations that we can handle successfully? Yeah, so, you know, you, the, the, the work that I presented right at the beginning, the, the CVPR 13 paper, mm -hmm. um, where we were learning the, the, the deformation model from, from the sequence, without making any assumptions whatsoever about the model, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's one extreme, right? That's saying, you know, can we can we do model free and can we actually even learn the model just from, mm -hmm. from the sequence? Not not just learn to track, but but actually learn learn an embedding, right? That's mm -hmm. then that could then be used later on to 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 track, for instance. So so that's one extreme as far as I can see, you know, and I think this is what you mean, right? That that on one end we've got what what happens if I don't make any assumptions whatsoever. I can throw anything at this scene. I I think that that in some ways it, it it doesn't quite work completely, right? We're still making some assumptions. You know, in that particular work, we were making the assumption that we had one object, and you know, we had that object was kind of segmented, or or we were only tracking that object. You know, what if, what if you have, you know, the kind of problems that you're working on, right? Where you're looking at the inside of the body and every pixel is moving in a, in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely, extremely hard then to actually segment into maybe some semantic, you know, because I, I think, I think that that's, that's a good approach. If we can segment and, and associate some semantic labels and say, oh, you know, this is a chair, therefore, I, you know, I might be able to, I, I have a model that that <laughs> tells me how the chairs deform. Uh, this is a human. Oh, you know, I have another model for the human. Mm -hmm. But what if everything is deforming? And uh, I think, you know, that, that that's a much harder case in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. But I, I still think that, you know, in I think for me, the answer is that if you, you always have to try and uh, and see, you know, what what's what's fixed. So, you know, learn learn a learn a model for for that particular type of of motion. And your priors sometimes have to be very loose. You know, may, maybe the prior is everything deforms in a smooth way. You know, or you have a low rank representation or something like that. And that's already a quite a powerful prior, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I think. I think that yeah, just just doing pure, you know, purely kind of data-driven tracking or something without any reasoning about the maybe some underlying priors. I don't I don't see that as the solution. I think mm -hmm. that for me the solution is really, you know, we we need to combine this kind of data-driven, you know, can we do photometric optimization things like this with mm -hmm. with really trying to reason about what what's uh, what's fixed in the scene what what's constant in the scene and and what can we how can how can we have a even if it's a high level prior model of the of the variations of the shape it's always going to be helpful um mm -hmm. i think just just mo completely model free is 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 not the way it's it's much better to try and yeah a, a model model these things i think probably for your kind of problems, you know, things like piecewise representations are are really mm -hmm. powerful. Um, yeah, okay. and uh, and and perhaps you know, at, at, at the same time, you know, sometimes you you might be able to to build like a synthetic model, and then that that's incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. If you can build a, a a good synthetic model, then then that's that's definitely incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. And in the in the development of the uh, formation analysis, uh, uh, do you think that uh, simulation is really a, a good approach to deal with the problem, or what are the limits of simulation? I mean, I think it's a good approach in the sense that you know 
if if you look at what we're constantly doing analysis by synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that that's what we're doing, and uh, so it it's really it, it is a really good way of mm -hmm. training training your models and and really getting to understand your models. You know, what's the variability mm -hmm. in your data? Um, I think it's a good approach. A, a different a different thing is that you know sometimes you. You know, we all know this that that you you simulate and and you know you you can only simulate what what you can model, what you know how <laughs> to model, and therefore there might be really difficult things like you know illumination and the interaction of the light with with uh, wet surfaces that produce these specularities that are crazy and uh, um, so those kind of things you know is we we need to find better ways of of you know this kind of sim to real um filling filling that gap i think that you know generative models are, are actually incredibly useful for this mm -hmm. they're, they're incredibly useful um so yeah but i i think i think that using simulation data is is a fantastic way if anything of you know in, introspection and really understanding the understanding the the the, the geometry of your models and the and in particular, you know, I really think for, for students, <laughs> I mean, this talk is for students, right? Um, I think students very often these days, they they want to get very quickly into training a network, you know, that's going to do this. And and I think that, you know, if you have to build a simulator, if you have to render some synthetic data, you need to understand a lot about the models, right? Um, because it doesn't just happen like that. Mm -hmm. You actually need to build mm -hmm. the model to be able to render um and 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 that's a really useful thing to do. Um, it, it's really useful for for students to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks a lot, Lourdes, again for for all these insights and tips for all kind of attendance, not just for the students. I think for all of us, yeah. it's uh, like really good pointers. Yeah. So maybe maybe we can I don't know if there's any last minute question, but maybe we can leave it here. Uh, we have already made 20 more minutes than we we told you, so that we don't want to steal much more time. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, uh, I'm I'm absolutely fine. Yeah, no, I'm I'm sorry that I took a bit longer <laughs> than I. No, 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 it was it was okay. perfect. Like perfect. Uh, we needed to go all the yeah. way till till the nerves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. It was perfect. The overview, perfect, really, yeah. really, really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have all enjoyed uh, this a lot. The, yeah, the complete overview. Mm -hmm. It's always so, good to. It's always good to be in Zaragoza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really hope that um, yeah, we can we can visit soon in in person because. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it, it seems things great, are yes. things are getting better. So definitely. We will repeat the invitation for for better times. Yeah, you you can see now a bit a uh, few more faces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mingo. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Yeah, maybe Julio. I don't know if we if we want to stop the recording and the streaming just in case somebody wants to catch up <laughs> without without the recording and the and the YouTube. Anytime, whenever you want. I mean, there's no, no questions we can... you, and I don't think I have any, any right now. So. <laughs> So we can we can stop we can stop the recording and no I know I know some